Chapter 4 The Attack on Religious Liberty Historically, there are two major stages in the attack on religious liberty. First, the state is secularized in the name of freedom, and second, every prerogative of the church is attacked in an indirect manner, so that, in disguised fashion, its right to exist is denied. The word tyrant, from the Greek tyrannos, meaning a secular ruler, one who rules without the sanction of religious law, with, quote, an authority that was not derived from the worship, a power that religion had not established, end quote. Its new principle of law was democracy, quote, the obedience of man to man, end quote. Quote, it's a general fact, and almost without exception in the history of Greece and of Italy, that the tyrants sprang from the popular party and had the aristocracy as enemies. End quote. Moreover, quote, the tyrant always made war upon the rich. End quote. Instead of a higher law, the tyrant sees his mandate in the will of the people. Vox populi, vox dei. Right is what the people want. Tyranny is thus inevitably in conflict with religion because it cannot tolerate a law which denies that the people are the source of law, which asserts that there is a divine order which stands in judgment over the human order. By affirming as his principle, the people, yes, the tyrant must sooner or later logically affirm its corollary by saying to God an emphatic no and however servile the churches and clergy may be, and however subversive of their faith, they must still be undermined. The very idea of religion, probably from the Latin word religare, to hold back, to bind fast, legare, to bind, means that the binding power between tyrant and people resides elsewhere than in his incarnation of the general will of the people. The United States, in its inception as a constitutional government, was not a secular state. As we have noted, it abstained from any particular form of Christian settlement because this was the prerogative of the states. Each of the constituent states was a Christian republic, and the federal government was restricted from making any laws interfering with their settlements. But the federal government was not secular. Indeed, not until the French Revolution introduced the concept did any state in the Western world contemplate the possibility of being a secular or non-Christian order. In a multitude of provisions placing the sanction of the faith upon its activities and by the oath of office, then an important religious act, the federal government made its Christian nature clear. Every state, including the United States, was immediately challenged by the French Revolution. The Enlightenment dream of reason was here translated into a walking nightmare, and this new French state, grounded on reason rather than the law of God, became at once the heavenly and the earthly city of the anti-Christian and deistic forces of the day. Academic discussions and table talk now become potent subversive political forces, the shock of this new movement was felt by every Western order, and in the United States, George Washington directed his farewell address to a consideration of it. Issued on September the 17th, 1796, Washington's farewell address cannot be understood except in terms of his deep concern over the events in Europe. For diplomatic reasons, France and its revolution are not named, but the basic ideas are dealt with. Washington struck out sharply at the concept of the secular state, at the belief that there could be a separation of religion and political order, and of religion and morality. Quote, of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. In vain would that man claim the tribute of patriotism who should labour to subvert these great pillars of human happiness these firmest props to the duties of men and citizens. The mere politician, equally with the pious man, ought to respect and to cherish them. 
a volume could not trace all our connections with private and public felicity, let it simply be asked, where is security for property, for reputation, for life, if the sense of religious obligation desert the oaths which are the instruments of investigation in courts of justice? Let us with caution indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion. Whatever may be conceded to the influence of refined education on minds of peculiar structure, reason and experience both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principle. It is substantially true that virtue or morality is a necessary spring of popular government. The rule, indeed, extends with more or less force to every species of free government. Who that is a sincere friend to it can look with indifference upon attempts to shake the foundation of the fabric? End quote. Quote, the foundation of the fabric, end quote, was, for Washington, the necessary connection between religion and morality. Washington's theological orientation is not our concern here, but his insistence on the primacy of the religious or theological issue is. As Washington saw it, the state is a form of moral order, and moral order rests on religion. Morality cannot be maintained without religion. Quote, the security for property, for reputation, for life, end quote, and the very courts of justice are gone when moral order is divorced from religion, theological order. What will happen if men look to reason rather than to religion for law? Men may perhaps agree generally that, quote, Thou shalt not steal, end quote, is a necessary law for social order, but they will not agree as readily to defining theft specifically. Is confiscatory taxation directed at the rich, the path to social justice, or is it immorality? Is inflation moral or is it theft? Is private property itself a moral order or is it a form of theft? In a quote-unquote rational order, the quote reason end quote of a majority or of a democratic elite will prevail and morality will change as that controlling group changes. Instead of fixed moral order, law will follow the election returns or the will of the establishment. Moral order, apart from theological order, is an illusion productive only of anarchy and decay. Indeed, quote, Reason and experience both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principle, end quote, that is, theological order. Washington's opposition to the secular state was thus clear-cut. It spelled the destruction of liberty and of all free civil government, quote, to every species of free government, end quote. Forces of secularization were present in Washington's day and later. French sympathizers and Jacobins, deists, Illuminati, Freemasons and soon the Unitarians. But the legal steps towards secularization were only taken in the 1950s and 1960s by the US Supreme Court. For the sake of argument, we may concede to the liberal and to some orthodox Christian scholars that deism had made extensive inroads into America by 1776 and 1787 and that the men of the Constitutional Convention and Washington were influenced by it. The fact still remains that they did not attempt to create a secular state. The states were Christian states, and the Federal Union, while barred from intervention in this area, was not itself secular. The citizens were citizens of their respective states and of the United States simultaneously. They could not be under two sets of religious law. Officers of the federal government, the president and congress worshipped as an official body, but without preference extended to a single church. The chaplaincy, oaths of office, the legal fact of the church as a separate law sphere, these and other things pointed to the acceptance of religious order as the foundation of moral and political order. Secularism asserts the self-sufficiency or self-containment of the moral and political order. Certainly, Arminianism and Deism prepared the ground for the acceptance of such a concept so that the seeds of secularism were present in colonial America. The constitutional system, however, 
was not the product of such seed, but of very concrete and long-standing realities. The Constitution was the capstone of the Protestant feudal restoration. The religious and political foundation lay far below it. The U.S. Supreme Court, in nullifying various religious practices in the States, has not struck out at novelties on the American scene, but at the legal situation as it has existed from the beginning of the United States to the present. Not until 1940, long after the 14th Amendment, 1868, was added to the Constitution, did the U.S. Supreme Court, quote, restrict state action respecting religion, end quote. At that time, quote, Without any change in the Constitution, it was held that the Constitution in this regard meant precisely the reverse of what it had meant for the first 152 years of its existence. End quote. The change came, but it was slow in coming. There was good reason for this delay, in spite of the intensity of this drive towards secularism. A singer has observed, quote, a Christian world and life view furnished the basis for this early political thought which guided the American people for nearly two centuries and whose crowning lay in the writing of the Constitution in 1787. This Christian theism had so permeated the colonial mind that it continued to guide even those who had come to regard the gospel with indifference or even hostility. The currents of this orthodoxy were too strong to be easily set aside by those who, in their own thinking, had come to a different conception of religion and hence of government also. End quote. Moreover, while Calvinism had receded in New England by 1787, it was coming into new power in the central states and in the south. And when Princeton Seminary was a lonely bastion of Calvinism in the north, that faith held sway in the south. Indeed, an important aspect of the Civil War was the Unitarian statist drive for an assault on its Calvinistic enemy, the South. In 1828-32, many Southern Conservatives had refused to support South Carolina and Calhoun in the nullification controversy because of the liberal theological orientation of its leaders. Thomas Cooper, President of the University of South Carolina, a major champion of nullification, was a noted deist and Unitarian. Unitarianism, however, quickly oriented itself to abolitionism, and the South, itself concerned about slavery, came to defend itself against the revolutionary principles which were being applied against it. One of the greatest of the Southern Presbyterian Calvinists, Benjamin M. Palmer, in his, quote, Thanksgiving sermon, end quote, of November the 29th, 1860 in New Orleans, took as his text Psalm 9420, Shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee, which frameth mischief by a law? And Obadiah 7, All the men of thy confederacy have brought thee even to the border, the men that were at peace with thee have deceived thee and prevailed against thee. They that eat thy bread have laid a wound under thee, there is none understanding in him. End quote. The Gathering Conflict South Carolina had moved as early as November the 17th, 1860, Palmer saw as the forces of false theology, of atheism and of the French Revolution, the religion of humanity in short, arrayed against a Christian people dedicated to faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour and to constitutional governments. These forces sought to frame Mischief by a law. The South had slavery. The North had its growing and fearful problems of capital versus labour. Interference by the one into the problems of the other could not be tolerated because it would be destructive of social order. Moreover, quote, In the imperfect state of human society, it pleases God to allow evils which check others that are greater. End quote. The anti-Christian Jacobin attack on slavery had to be fought and slavery defended because the revolutionary reordering of society would be far worse than anything it sought to supplant. Quote, human legislation, end quote, was seeking to supplant God and to set, quote, bounds to what God can alone regulate, end quote. Quote, the country is convulsed simply because 
the throne of iniquity frameth mischief by a law. End quote. In a remarkable paragraph, Palmer summarized the basic issue very bluntly. Quote, Last of all, in this great struggle, we defend the cause of God and religion. The abolition spirit is undeniably atheistic. The demon which erected its throne upon the guillotine in the days of Robespierre and Marat, which abolished the Sabbath and worshipped reason in the person of a harlot, yet survives to work other horrors, of which those of the French Revolution are but the type. Among a people so generally religious as the American, a disguise must be worn, but it is the same old threadbare disguise of the advocacy of human rights. From a thousand Jacobin clubs here, as in France, the decree has gone forth which strikes at God by striking at all subordination and law, availing itself of the morbid and misdirected sympathies of men, it has entrapped weak consciences in the meshes of its treachery, and now at last has seated its high priest upon the throne, clad in the black garments of discord and schism, so symbolic of its ends. Under this suspicious cry of reform, it demands that every evil shall be corrected or society become a wreck. The sun must be stricken from the heavens if spot is found upon his disc. The Most High, knowing his own power, which is infinite, and his own wisdom, which is unfathomable, can afford to be patient. But these self-constituted reformers must quicken the activity of Jehovah or compel his abdication. In their furious haste, they trample upon obligations sacred as any which can bind the conscience. It's time to reproduce the obsolete idea that providence must govern man, and not that man shall control providence. In the imperfect state of human society, it pleases God to allow evils which check others that are greater. As in the physical world, objects are moved forward, not by a single force, but by the composition of forces, so, in his moral administration, there are checks and balances whose intimate relations are comprehended only by himself. But what wreck they of this, these fierce zealots who undertake to drive the chariot of the sun? Working out the single and false idea which rides them like a nightmare, they dash athwart the spheres, utterly disregarding the delicate mechanism of providence which moves on, wheels within wheels, with pivots and balances and springs, which the greater designer alone can control. Spirit of atheism, which knows no God who tolerates evil, no Bible which sanctions law, and no conscience that can be bound by oaths and covenants, has selected for us its victims and slavery for its issue. Its banner cry rings out already upon the air. Liberty, equality, fraternity, which simply interpreted mean bondage, confiscation, and massacre. With its trickler waving in the breeze, it waits to inaugurate its reign of terror. To the south, the high position is assigned of defending before all nations the cause of all religion and of all truth. In this trust, we are resisting the power which wars against constitutions and laws and compacts, against Sabbaths and sanctuaries, against the family the state and the church, which blasphemously invades the prerogatives of God and rebukes the Most High for the errors of his administration, which, if it cannot snatch the reign of empires from his grasp, will lay the universe in ruins at its feet. Is it possible that we shall decline the onset? End quote. This attention to Palmer may seem at first glance merely an interesting digression from the question of secularization, but certainly Palmer felt that secularization was the issue. The United States in that day was definitely Christian. Calvinism had lost ground to Arminian revivalism in the North and West, but it commanded much of the South. It was necessary, therefore, to disguise the secularization with ostensibly Christian idealism. Quote, among a people so generally religious as the Americans, a disguise must be worn, 
but it is the same old threadbare disguise of the advocacy of human rights. End quote. It was the assertion of the primacy of moral order instead of theological order, and an insistence sometimes on the independence of the moral order. It was what Washington termed it, quote, the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion, end quote. It was, moreover, the belief that no religion could dare exist if any evil continued. Quote, Under this suspicious cry of reform, it demands that every evil shall be corrected, or society become a wreck. The sun must be stricken from the heavens if a spot is found upon his disk. End quote. The religion of humanity disguised itself in terms calculated to arouse the simple evangelical adherence of the religion of Jesus Christ to a feeling of guilt unless certain political goals were attained. Both church and state were to be secularized by the disguised promulgation of secular goals and secular laws. The, quote, social gospel, end quote, made men feel steadily that the, quote, theological gospel, end quote, was relevant and trivial. It was deemed silly and irrelevant to insist on strict Trinitarianism and on the divine institution or ordination of civil government and man's duty to recognise and obey authorities when man was in need. The preeminent fact was not the satisfaction of the justice of God in the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ and the law orders attendant upon that fact, but it was instead the satisfaction of man. Thus, from the Civil War to World War II, the goals of the state were secularised and nationalised. The purposes of law became increasingly not the reflection of God's justice without respect of persons, but social justice, the triumph of humanism. After World War II, the United States saw the steady internationalization of its religion of humanity and, at the same time, attention was finally given to the legal secularization of the states. With the rising tide of conservatism, both economic and political, and then the steady association of this with the revival of Christian orthodoxy, the legal possibility of exploiting the long-latent potentialities of a Christian society had to be nullified. In 1954, the Pledge of Allegiance had two words added to it, quote, One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all, end quote, by act of Congress. At about the same time, the US Supreme Court commented, quote, We are a religious people whose institutions presuppose a supreme being. Zorak v. Clausen, 343, US 306, 313. Carefully nurtured, planned and financed test cases were already underway and the matter built up to the New York prayer case, June the 25th, 1962. The outcry over this case exceeded previous decisions because the extent of conservative resistance was now greater. Quote, a heavy volume of mail, end quote, reached the US Supreme Court. Quote, almost none of it complimentary, end quote. Extensive editorial comments also indicated the general dismay at the decision. It was widely recognised that the US Supreme Court had changed the law, that it had reversed long-standing and fully legal practices. As even one temporising newspaperman wrote with reference to the First Amendment, quote, At the time of its adoption, nine of the 13 states had established churches, some legislators voted for the amendment in the belief that it would prevent the new federal government from interfering with these state, quote, establishments of religion, end quote. Others had precisely the opposite intent. Thomas Jefferson, in a private letter, construed the amendment as erecting, quote, a wall of separation between church and state, end quote. Many, then as now, took it to mean what James Madison said in his first draft, Quote, the civil rights of none shall be abridged on account of religious beliefs or worship, nor shall any national religion be established. End quote. It was obvious, even to such writers, even as they tried to moderate the facts, that radical changes had been introduced. 
Neither the nine states nor any of the others had any expectation whatsoever when the First Amendment was ratified that it would do more than bar Congress from interference in religious matters, and not a single state practice then or later was modified because of it. Castles stated the point of the decision, however. Mandatory neutrality was implied. Quote, if this constitutional philosophy is carried to its logical conclusion, as Justices William O. Douglas and Potter Stewart said in their opinions in the prayer case, it would seem to prohibit tax exemptions to churches and many other long-established government practices. End quote. Cases were started to prohibit tax exemption to churches, to abolish under God from the Pledge of Allegiance, and in God we trust from public documents and from money. The American Civil Liberties Union was active in such matters. In spite of the storm of protest, all kinds of steps to further secularization were immediately taken. Christmas carols and nativity scenes in schools were barred. Chief Justice Earl Warren of the U.S. Supreme Court was hostile to the inscription of In God We Trust on the Supreme Court building. Examples of the extent to which legal use was made of the new ruling can be cited from Santa Monica, California. Public Works Director Bartlett L. Kennedy asked City Attorney Robert G. Gawkins to rule first on the distribution of religious literature and boxes at Palisades Park and, second, on the annual Christmas nativity scenes there. Quote, Kennedy promptly forbade further distribution of the matter in the park, end quote, with a ruling on the nativity scenes promised early the next week. Quote, a wave of protests, end quote, compelled the city council to rescind the ban, but the mayor, Rex Minter, attempted to dismiss the issue as, quote, a tempest in a teapot, end quote, to which the Reverend A.J. Edwards, Church of the Nazarene, made emphatic denial. However, as one writer observed, the major battle between, quote, religion and rights, end quote, is, quote, yet to break, end quote, as indicated earlier, the first stage of the attack on religious liberty is the secularization of the state in the name of freedom. This secularization is both philosophical and legal. The meaning and goals of the state are secularized, and then, its life being now secular, its laws are divorced from the Christian faith. In the second stage of the attack, the prerogatives and liberty of the church are attacked in an indirect and disguised fashion so that gradually its very right to exist is denied. No attempt will be made here to give a full account of these attacks, only to indicate something of their nature and direction. Certainly, a central thrust in this stage of attack is to remove tax exemption from the churches. A new story indicates the reality of this factor. Quote, Baltimore, October the 16th, AP. Madeleine Murray, whose suit in the U.S. Supreme Court knocked our required prayer and Bible reading in public schools, has filed another one which challenges tax exemptions for church-owned property. Mrs. Murray's lawyer filed suit in Superior Court Tuesday, asking the court to declare the tax exemption unconstitutional. Her argument is that the exemption places a financial burden on her. Furthermore, she says, the practice denies taxpayers due process of law under the 14th Amendment and it violates the principle of church-state separation. The suit contends that property taxes for individuals would be reduced by 1-5% to if the churches are made to pay. End quote. There are many other things today that place a quote, financial burden end quote, on Mrs. Murray by means of taxation, but she has no desire to have these things declared unconstitutional. It would be true, yet beside the point, to defend the tax exemption of churches on the grounds that they are non profit institutions and corporations. The real issue is the liberty of the church. As the US Supreme Court itself noted early in its history, quote, the power to tax is the power to destroy, end quote. It is as unjust to place the church under the state as it is to place this state under the church. The tax exemption of the church went hand in hand with the state's abstention from the internal affairs of the churches, their law, government and doctrine, 
on the grounds that church and state constitute two different law spheres, both directly under God rather than under one another. To ask the church to render tribute unto Caesar is to deny that it has any direct approach to God, to declare in essence that the church's approach to God and man is mediated through the state. This is precisely the same issue as that involved in emperor worship in the days of the Roman Empire and in Shinto shrine worship in the Japanese Empire. It can be objected that a number of prominent churchmen, and some church groups as well, can be cited in favour of the taxation of churches. The obvious answer is an examination of the records of these persons and groups. They have not distinguished themselves in the defence of Christian orthodoxy. Rather, they have been eloquent champions of the religion of humanity, of a socialised order, and a social rather than a theological gospel. It is futile to grant religious liberty if this right over the church be claimed. The USSR is ready to affirm a constitutional freedom of worship, but its claim to the control of religion renders this guarantee null and void. In the days of the Roman Empire, it was the time-serving and heretical clergy who promoted imperial power and saw the emperor as the true representative of God on earth. The Orthodox churchmen refused to submit to a subordinationist Christology or to recognize the mediatorial role of the state and were persecuted for this faith. If the church pays taxes to the state, it means that the church then exists in the state and by the grace of the state and is a subject or citizen of the state. This, the true church, can never recognize nor permit. Emperor worship does not become respectable and holy by its transference from Rome to the United States. Already steps are being taken to prepare the way for renewed emperor worship. It was once sufficient for a church to be in existence and to have purchased or built its property in order to attain its tax-exempt status. Inroads are being made on this. One inroad is the annual requirement for the filing of tax-exempt papers by churches so that the church must annually confirm its status. The churches are assured that this is a mere formality, but the requirement of this mere formality is a requirement of submission. Another planned inroad is a nominal annual filing fee for the tax exemption so that a tax is imposed for tax exemption. All this is disguised rather than direct. It is all the more an insidious attack on religious liberty and more dangerous in that few are able to detect its implications and direction. Another major area of attack is through planning commissions and zoning laws. Zoning laws have an air of progress and civic improvement and they appeal to the desire of people to improve their property while steadily infringing on their property rights. As early as the 1940s, the Federal Council of Churches of Christ, together with the local council of churches and the Home Missions Council of North America, developed a, quote, master plan for the location and relocation of Protestant churches. Dr. H. Paul Douglas, Director and Cooperative Field Research for the FCCCA, toured the country, conferring with the local leaders to set up the plan. Area committee councils of cooperating churches were created. The plan for the proper location of churches was then urged on city planning commissions. Very quickly, Orthodox church groups outside the FCCCCA find themselves unable to get permits to build. Thus, the Reverend Lawrence R. Ayers had organised the first Orthodox Presbyterian Church in Portland, Oregon, and applied for permission to build on their lots. The answer they received was the following statement. There are already enough churches of all denominations to serve the needs of this community, and it is therefore economically unsound to place additional churches there. End quote. When Ayers sought to push the matter, quote, then began a campaign of innuendo and political wire pulling which should bring shame to the faces of people who call themselves Christian. 
City employees, when approached about the matter, directed inquirers to the Portland Council of Churches with the information that the First Orthodox Presbyterian Church was a, quote, non-cooperative church, end quote. A campaign was begun to get signatures on a petition to City Council urging the denial of the application. Every conceivable argument, logical and illogical, prejudicial to the project was used, end quote. The First Orthodox Presbyterian Church, facing a long legal battle and declining attendance because of inadequate rented facilities, bought property outside the city limits, built there and prospered. This was not an isolated instance. Many other such evangelical churches have been subjected to the same denial of their right to exist, and the matter becomes more difficult as county planning commissions are created, so that both city and county now govern the right of existence for the church. This denial, through the subterfuge of zoning laws of the right to exist to certain churches, has been upheld by the US Supreme Court, a fact which should surprise no one. The courts, meanwhile, are extending the ancient freedom of Christianity to a religion so that it is no longer necessary to believe in God to qualify as a conscientious objector to military service. In some cities and counties, as the subdivider of a new housing development plans is tracked with the planning commission, provision is made for three religious bodies only. A Roman Catholic church, a synagogue and a Protestant church which is on the approved list. These local plans, be it noted, reflect the ideas of national bodies, both urban planning and religious organisations. An unapproved church is barred from the development. In the name of, quote, civil rights, end quote, some lots or homes may sometimes be sold to negroes and the courts increasingly further such action, which conforms to the religion of humanity, but a church can be denied the right of purchase in the name of planning. Another aspect of this struggle is the outright elimination of churches and sometimes private schools as well from a city via zoning restrictions. This can be done in two ways. The first is by a quota system. An editorial in a California paper cites this method. Quote, it is interesting to note that the Los Altos Hills Town Council has once again emphasised the fact that it is opposed to churches. The present plan of the city calls for not more than 8% of total land area to be used for other than residential use. Since churches fall into that category and the location of Foothill College in the area more than oversubscribes the allotted non-residential use, land for church use is taboo unless additional annexations are proposed. Religious liberties and civil liberties go hand in hand. Here is a golden opportunity for someone to fight for a worthy cause. Is anybody willing? End quote. This quota system can prevent new churches from coming in, as in Los Altos Hills, or simply forbid the building of churches in totally new communities. Exception to the quota system is made where public schools are concerned, of course. The second means is to leave out churches directly, eliminating them from every kind of zone, business, industrial or residential. All kinds of reasons are mobilised to show how undesirable the church is in any and all of these zones. The arrogance, moreover, of the enemies of religious liberty is staggering. In one small rural town of less than 4,000 people, famous in the state as a church town, a new school teacher bitterly objected to the Lutheran church bell, a delight to the community and with a history of about 80 or more years and two churches behind it. The bell rang at 9.30 each Sunday morning and the teacher complained that it awakened him and infringed upon his liberty. Another means of eliminating certain types of churches is by denying permission to new church bodies to begin their existence modestly in homes. A California newspaper report cites an instance of such regulations under the title, quote, Use of homes as churches to be curbed, end quote. Quote, Redwood City. The use of homes as part-time churches will be strongly discouraged under new policy amendments approved Wednesday by the San Mateo County Planning Commission. 
architectural designs of proposed churches, along with site plans, will be required prior to approval of church use permits in residential areas. If the same space is proposed for use both for living and religious services, planners will not approve the permit according to the revised policy. Assistant County Planning Director Lars Anderson, who drew up the policy amendments, said this was not intended to prohibit rectories or ministers' homes from being located on the same property as churches. The amendments also specify that churches must be located on a minimum of 20,000 square feet of land and provide for posting of a bond to control compliance with these conditions. End quote. The Christian Church of the New Testament era would have been eliminated by such zoning laws because, while it spread extensively across the empire, numbering possibly half a million, its numbers were limited in the local churches and all met in homes. There is no record of any church building in the New Testament. Today, these laws are an effective deterrent to theological revolt. Many of the small, conservative and growing churches of today began in the 30s and 40s, meeting at homes in protest against the liberal trends in the major churches. For a handful of five or ten persons, sometimes actually supporting a pastor, to rent facilities or purchase property is prohibitive. Continued protest is thus cut off at the roots when people cannot revolt against the churches which are a part of the establishment without being required to have all the means of institutional maturity. Curbing or banning the use of homes as churches is also a very serious roadblock to the formation of new negro church bodies. Historically, the church in the home has a major role here. Today, as some Negros are unhappy over the social gospel emphasis in their established churches and hanker for the old-time religion, they are confronted with a new-time law which says, in effect, Thou shalt not worship God except as the state allows it. The religious broadcasting rights of conservative groups have long been under attack. Repeatedly attempts have been made to bar non-cooperating Protestant groups from radio and television, sometimes with some success. Valiant battle against these infringements of liberty have been waged by some groups, among whom the Christian Beacon and Carl McIntyre have been notable. A similar battle is being waged against broadcasting by economic and political conservatives, and on December the 19th, 1961, on the request of US Attorney General Robert Kennedy, Victor Ruther submitted, quote, the Ruther Memorandum to the Attorney General of the United States, end quote, calling for infringement of the liberties of conservatives. Congressman Charles Gubser of California reported that the proposed suppression of such liberties had been started in the Federal Communication Commission's Fairness Doctrine. Another means of attack on the freedom of the church is through legislation aimed at furthering, quote unquote, tolerance. Actually, the only tolerance in such proposed legislation is for the religion of humanity. For the religion of Jesus Christ, there is only intolerance. Such proposed legislation followed quickly after the organization of the United Nations and the late 1940s saw attempts at wholesale regimentation of religious thought. Failing this, piecemeal legislation has since then been introduced and in some areas passed. Let us examine the wholesale legislation as it was proposed in California but failed to pass. In the California Legislature 1949 regular session, Assembly Bill No. 403 was introduced on January 12, 1949 by Messrs. Rosenthal, Gaffney, Crowley, Hawkins, Elliott, Lewis, Rumford and Thomas. Quote, An act to add Section 421 to the Penal Code relating to the discrediting of a religious denomination or a person because of his religious belief, the people of the state of California do an act as follows. Section 1. Section 41 is added to the Penal Code to read 421. Any person who promulgates any propaganda designed to belittle, ridicule, upbraid, condemn or hold up to scorn and contempt any religious system or denomination or otherwise attempt to discredit any church, synagogue, temple or religious institution or denomination duly incorporated in the state or libels or slandered 
any such church, synagogue, temple or religious denomination, or holds up to scorn and contempt and ridicule, any person or group because of his or their religious belief or worship shall be guilty of a misdemeanour. End quote. On January the 13th of the same 1949 session, the much longer Assembly Bill No. 529 was introduced, also failing to pass, called, quote, An act to prohibit the advocation of hatred by reason of race, colour or religion, and effectuate the Bill of Rights and providing penalties, end quote. The first bill provided a penalty as a misdemeanour of six months maximum imprisonment or a fine not to exceed $500 or both. The second bill in Section 3 set forth a maximum fine of $10,000 or imprisonment not to exceed two years or both and also disenfranchisement for ten years. The second bill effectually nullified the preaching of Orthodox Christianity or of anything except the religion of humanity. As Paul R. Cowles of Berkeley, California, in a newsletter of March 5th, 1949, commented, quote, This means that if one is faithful to the Bible, God's Word, and preaches in accordance therewith, that any religion or denomination who or which denies the need of the blood atonement of Jesus Christ on Calvary or denies the deity of Christ are sinners and unsaved, destined to eternal punishment, would be a violator of these proposed laws. End quote. Since then, the piecemeal approach has been used. Tolerance regulations govern state college campuses and, in various ways, the religion of humanity is being equated with the only possible moral or legal standard. It is apparent that, in all this, Orthodox Christianity has two great open enemies, the heretical liberal clergy and churches and the courts. It is interesting to note that liberal churches have been ready to defend Henry Miller's books and communists in the name of liberty while denying the right of existence to Orthodox Christianity. Tyranny, as was noted earlier, was in its origin secularism, a rule founded on man-made laws. This secularism is the religion of humanity, the most oppressive, dangerous and persecuting of all cults because it has no law beyond itself as a check to its lust for power. Christianity is being disestablished in the several states of the United States of America only to make way for the savage establishment of the religion of humanity. The goal of this new religion is the kingdom of this world and it is ready to bless and give a part in that kingdom to the true church on one condition. All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. The answer, however, was made long ago in the wilderness. Then Jesus said unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Matthew 4, 9 and 10 In the name of civil defence, it is already planned that, in the next war, the Orthodox, non-cooperating churches will be denied their status as valid churches. Unregistered clergy will have no rights to minister to the sick and the dying. Any such clergy trying to minister to their flock Quote, will find a shotgun in his belly, end quote, according to a civil defence leader. One final note. On June 25th, 1962, when the US Supreme Court banned a simple non-compulsory prayer from New York schools, it also issued a decision which reversed a post office order banning from the mails three magazines aimed at homosexuals. The vote was six to one. Justice Harlan, who gave the court's opinion, stated that, quote, These magazines are printed primarily for homosexuals and have no literary, scientific or other merit, end quote. In spite of this admission by what one writer called, quote, a kind of legal double talk, end quote, the ban was lifted. Obscenity laws are being made increasingly invalid by court decisions. On the same day, in the name of liberty, prayer was banned and the propagation of perversion was permitted. A grim parallel comes to mind. A man who is increasingly a hero of some modern liberals is the Marquis de Sade, 1740 to 1814. Sade was a follower of Marat, 
and with Robespierre, a member of the Section des Piques. The Marquis de Sade approved heartily of the execution of Jesus Christ while calling for total freedom for every kind of sexual perversion. For Sade, quote, true wisdom, end quote, meant, quote, not repressing our vices, since these vices constitute almost the only happiness in our life, end quote, and, quote, to repress them would be to become our own executioners, end quote. Instead, we should, quote, unquote, abandon ourselves to them with such secrecy and such extensive precautions that we may never be caught out. Do not be afraid that this may diminish their delight. Mystery adds to the pleasure. End quote. The Marquis de Sade wrote on religion in his La philosophie dans le boudoir, stating, quote, We need a faith, a faith suited to the republican character and far removed from ever possibly resuming that of Rome. In an age when we are so convinced that religion must rest upon morality and not morality upon religion, we need a religion in tune with our way of life, as it were the development, the inevitable extension of it, a religion which can elevate the soul and keep it perpetually at the level of that precious liberty which it venerates today as its only idol. End quote. These ideas were, as he indicated, common to the revolutionary thought of his day and in later days as well. Sad, however, was prepared to apply his rationalism more systematically. The Marquis called for the abolition, quote, forever of the atrocity of the death penalty, end quote. One of his reasons being, quote, it has never stamped out crime, end quote. Laws against theft he saw as inconsistent with, quote, the maintenance of perfect equality between citizens the equal submission of all to the law protecting the property of all, end quote. A law is not very just if it, quote, orders the man with nothing to respect the man with everything, end quote. Sad also opposed laws against prostitution, adultery, incest, rape and sodomy. Immorality and immodesty are necessary, he felt, for true republicanism. Moreover, marriage and monogamy are wrong. Quote, An act of possession can never be exercised over a free being. The exclusive possession of a woman is as unjust as the ownership of slaves. All men are born free. All are equal in their rights. Never forget these principles. According to them, therefore, no one sex can ever be granted a legitimate right to take exclusive possession of the other, and one of these sexes or one of these classes can never possess the other arbitrarily. End quote. For sad, Orthodox Christian theology and morality were false and should be illicit, banned by law. True equality made them impossible to accept. For sad, whatever can occur in nature is morally permissible, hence homosexuality. Sodomy was natural and good. Quote, can we possibly imagine nature giving us the possibility of committing a crime which would offend her? End quote. Murder too, he saw as virtue. Quote. The most independent of men and those closest to nature are savages. With impunity they devote themselves to murder every day. End quote. To cite more is unnecessary. Sad religion of humanity only ended up in total inhumanity, and with the confinement of Sad as criminally insane. The religion of humanity, by subordinating the moral order to man rather than to God, enthrones anarchy and chaos. It begins with idealism and ends in the dark Saturnalia of equality in death. <laughs>